Could you stand with us? As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. As he, As he went, went along, along people he fed their thoughts on the road. The whole crowd of disciples uh, began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Lift up your head, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Who is he? And is this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is, he is the king of glory.
to invite people to church. It's a common tradition to attend church on Sunday. Please bring your friends and let's just fill this sanctuary. We have all kinds of services coming up. There's Wednesday night service, Monday Thursday service with communion at 7 p.m. on Thursday evening. On Good Friday, we will have a noon service, which we do quickly so that you can get out, come, get out and go back to work. Not all of you are blessed like me and get off Good Friday. It's one of the interesting things, the New York Stock Exchange has always been closed on Good Friday. And then on Easter Sunday, we have our hillside service at 8.30, our Easter brunch at 9.15, kids Easter egg hunt at 9.45, and then our family worship service beginning at 10.30 here in the sanctuary. We hope that you will be a part of that and invite someone. Also, just a few reminders that there are donations needed for Easter eggs and candy for next week. You will please bring those by Wednesday night so that maybe our teens can help stuff those eggs on Wednesday night. They helped do that last year and that was a great project for them. So we hope you'll get all those donations into the church office <coughs> or bring them Wednesday evening. Is the lunch provided, the brunch provided? Or, yes, there is. Or do people no. bring food? Oh, for, <laughs> for a reminder for brunch <laughs> next Sunday. Please, everyone bring a, a brunch item to share in the brunch so that we can all enjoy a, a fellowship together. So we'll have the brunch and the Easter egg hunt in place of Sunday school classes for next week. And TNT people, come on up here. We had a group go to Trevecca Nazarene University last weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's a long trip, but they had a great time. And it's where Nazarenes from all over the southeastern region gather at Trevecca Nazarene University and exhibit their different talents. And it's a wide and varied talent that they, they do. We had a great time. Um, the, the three of these, and Tiana and Troy and I went to TNT. Um, Heather and Tiana played flag football. Um, Lexi played volleyball. And Charlie played soccer. And Charlie's team came in second place in the region. <laughs>
Hey, uh, before we receive this morning's tithes and offerings, let me say again, thank you so much for your faithfulness and who you are. And I know it's the holiday season and people coming and going and doing what they need to do, but uh, so glad that you are here and you've been so faithful. Hey, I have one I'd like to share for the moment. Richard Case is wanting to share a little announcement with you, if I may, or a comment. Sure. It's really a praise. Amen. Each of you have been praying for Cherry's brother. Y'all know I'm on Christ, so just get used to it. It's after Aunt Betty. Yeah, exactly. It comes in the family from Aunt Betty, so y'all understand. But anyway, without God's help, Mike will be here. Amen. Amen. So your prayers mean a lot to us. Amen. Amen. It helps. Boost us, lift us, and most of all, to help God reach down and touch my. Amen. Amen. Still has a long way to go, but we have it back in Tallahassee finally. Three weeks of champ is a long time. Those hotels aren't cheap, by the way. <laughs> Especially when they have an activity going on that they jump to three and four hundred dollars a night, they get stuff. But that's that's nothing. That's just material stuff. Our hearts in the right place, but we just want to say thank you. We love you, yeah. and always ask, and we will pray with you. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Gentlemen, if you come, we receive this morning's regular tithe and offering. Do you have someone you've been praying for lately? Yes. If you don't have anyone to pray for, pray for me. Amen. I'll be your focus. Pray for you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Dear Father, we just love you and thank you for this morning and thank you for the privilege of being in your house. And thank you for everyone who is here on this Palm Sunday. Oh, Father, today as we celebrate this time, we're just not only reminded of who you are, but we're reminded of who we are in your sight. And today we are needy people. We are the sheep in your pasture, in your fields who need a touch, a fresh touch from you today. But may we be reminded always as we remain faithful to you, oh Lord, you said you would never leave us and you would never forsake us. Lord, the world is telling us how to live our own lives, how to live every day, how to make decisions that please us. But Lord, your word declares that we need to live every day to please you. And we do that today, and we surrender the service to you for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
this morning as we prepare our hearts. I want to invite you to a time of prayer. I want to invite you to a time of just doing some introspecting, looking inside of your spirit today, into your heart. What if Jesus would have stayed in heaven and chosen never to come to earth? If the Father had never sent him, what life could possibly have been like? When he was chosen to go and become the lamb, the lamb slain before the foundations of the earth, to know that he was willing to give his life up before the creation of all the stars and the planets, everything in existence, to know that one day he would lay his life down for us, to realize the plan that the Father has had all this time was for you and me. We're so unworthy even just to receive these elements of communion today. The bread and the cup, in a moment we're going to have everyone stand and move to the center aisle and have you come and receive the bread and dip into the right cup or to the left cup, whichever side you're seated on. Receive it, dip it, receive it, and partake of it, and be seated, and go back into a time of just a prayerful meditation, if you would. As the song is being played, he's the Prince of Peace. Jesus came as we were going to look in just a moment, John chapter 12, for a time of Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the setting of the whole time of Holy Week, the moment of knowing that He was coming in for a time of celebration that appeared, and how He had compassion upon the people. And yet, just in a few days, everything would seemingly change, wouldn't it? Aren't you grateful today to know that He changed your eternity by your trusting in Him? There's not a sin too great that you have had or live or possibly have in your life. Hopefully you've got out of the sin business. But there's nothing in all of your life that's too harsh that God cannot change, that God cannot heal. Amen. And today He's a healing God. He's come to change your life. And for a moment, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask that He would just sanctify and to set these elements apart for our service even today. Our Father, today as we bow before you, we ask as we lift this bread up that you would set it apart for our service this very day. You said, for as often as you receive this, do so in remembrance of me. At the end of that, John chapter 12 and in the other portions of the gospel, even 1 Corinthians 11, where it's spoken of by the Apostle Paul of these elements, that not only did they have bread, but they had a cup that they received after supper. Father, when it was lifted up, it was asked of you that you would anoint and bless it as well. So today we consecrate these two elements and ask that you would take these elements, although it's bread and it's juice, it symbolizes that of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Today, O oh Lord, to you, we come and offer ourselves to you to remember not only what you've done for us back then, but what you want to do through us today. In your name, Jesus, we ask these things for your presence. If I could, I have some helpers coming to serve for this morning, and they could come and stand, and we'll have the bread in the, mo in the middle. We'll have a cup on each side. Please be careful of the palm branches. If you could, feel free if you'd like to participate today. This is open to anyone. You don't have to be a member of this local church to participate in the Lord's Cup and bread. So you're very welcome. If you're a Christian today, Please come and stand and share this time of element as we receive today. Just come and receive the bread, dip into the cup, receive it as a blessing from God. Please step now. You're welcome to receive these elements.
on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he had lifted up the bread. He talked about the one who would dip into the cup with him, would deny him. Some didn't understand why Judas was such in a hurry to participate. But Jesus had told Judas, what you must do, do quickly. The other disciples didn't understand. They thought he was going out to buy more elements. It turned out to be he was going to go turn Jesus' name in to the Romans to let them know where he would be later in that garden, praying even for up to three hours of time. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares about every need that you have within your life. And today, He calls upon you to be His servant. He calls upon each of us to carry His name until the time He calls us or He comes and receives us. He's coming again, my friends. He's coming again. Please be ready. They could come today. May the Lord bless and keep you. May His Spirit anoint you. May His heart love you through and through. May the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart be acceptable in His Son. For He is the Lord, He is our rock, He is our salvation. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. And we know that in all things, all things work together for good for them that are called, called according to His purposes. Give him glory today. We thank him for his goodness, his mercy. Ashamed of the 
gospel. I'm not ashamed of the rain. If it's going to rain, it's going to rain. And if the wind's going to blow, the wind's going to blow. And one of you has told me this morning, and if the wind blows the roof off of this building, let it be. Now I would tell you just in part of just, you know, you would never be in a sanctuary, in a gymnasium during a tornado. Because that's the worst place the roof can come right off. This building is no different. The best place possibly, since the pews are mounted to the floor, might be under the pews. <laughs> or two, there may be, I was thinking, how many people can we get into this little cubby hole here of the baptistry steps, you know? That might be a place, or into the baptistry area. But any exterior wall, I'm not anticipating it's going to happen. But I wanted to go on record to let you know, I care deeply about you. I don't want anything ever to happen to any of our folks. But we do have to be aware, the wind comes and it falls on the just and the unjust. Amen? Amen. So uh, be thinking ahead. don't want you to be worried. I want you to trust in the Lord. Pray for me again if you need to. That would be awesome. Hey, today, I wanted to, uh, in a moment, <coughs> we're going to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, this new series that we've been doing. And for this month, it's called His Story, or History, if you will. So in a moment, we're going to just uh, have that ready. Um, is there a way to fix the... No, wait, okay, let's we'll see. We'll see if we can get this going. Oh, good. Oh, there's a set of slides that's not on there. Okay. All right. I had a countdown set of slides of ten, the top ten, and they're not on there. Hmm, what's going to happen? Okay, well, we won't do those. Save time. Yeah, save some time. That must, the Lord must have said, don't put those on there. I was borrowing from my friend uh, who's passed away, Stan Toller, and uh, it was the top ten things of saying about, uh, you know, you're getting old, that kind of thing. It's like, and the last one was, you know, you know you're getting old when you know that the dead, you once knew that the Dead Sea was only sick. <laughs> Okay, all right. And you said it might happen. Okay. In John chapter 12 is a passage in the Gospels that I love to read about. And it's 15 verses. And I like to read those through with you if you like to watch those over my shoulder as well. And part of what we're looking at here is knowing that at the beginning, Lazarus has just been raised from the dead in chapter 11. In fact, the shortest verse in the Bible is found in John 11, 35, anyone know what that is? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. You've got a verse memorized. Praise God. I love that. It's so awesome. That's one of the verses you need to remember. Lazarus had been dead for four days. And from the four days, the Bible says in a special way in the King James, he stinketh. <laughs> so I guess we all would after four days of time. I've met people living who stinketh after four days. I was out working in the yard a little bit the other day, and my wife said, Ooh! Your clothing is stinketh. It's really bad. So she took it out in the backyard and buried it, and the dogs wouldn't move. It must have been really bad. And so we come to verse 1, and it says, It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor, and Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with Jesus. Now, get this point. A dead man is about to eat food with Jesus. Formerly dead. When Jesus comes and touches you, you're no longer dead. Amen? Amen. Amen. Think about that. Just If you don't hear anything else, remember that. When Jesus touches you, you're no longer a dead person. Amen. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the aroma of that perfume. Can't you imagine what it must have been like? Another passage in the gospel said that she actually poured it on his head, but this one says it's on his feet. Good reason. If you're wearing sandals in the dusty areas of uh, Jerusalem in those days, they didn't have boots, they didn't have strings they could pull up, they would wash people's feet and so on, but sometimes people needed it's a kind of an anointing. But there's a purpose why she anointed his feet. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Now, Judas didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and a keeper of the money. He used to help himself to what was put in it. Interesting. 
That's why we have checks and balances even in the church. When you, when you donate, when your stewardship, that's why one person doesn't take care of all the monies. We have a team of people even watching what you have given as well. Yeah, I keep having a flip up here. It's, it's not painting up there. It's not painting behind you. Oh, okay. Well, that one, we have a screen behind you, so it helps me to look real professional. <laughs> And it's, it's still on a preset. It's like it needs to go under the, uh, it needs to go into the same screen as the other one. We're going to catch up. That storm's on the way. But that's <laughs> Andrew's done such a great job. I want to say thank you in the meantime, just in a small commercial. We've had to update some computers and projectors because of the, uh, they died. That's basically it. So they died, and so we had to do that. So it's really important, especially at this time of the season. It's so in a judgment of importance for us. So in PowerPoint, so this is not working. Okay, I can talk without it. It's okay. We'll talk a second here. Let's see what happens here. There you go. back. Let's see, did it change? Yep. Change. Oh glory, hallelujah. You should give Andrew a hand. She's so good. It's not changing to say, it's not changing. Okay, we'll think we're in a country church somewhere. It'll be fine. <laughs> the next day, the great crowd had come for the festival that had uh, Jesus, that why he was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. The very word Hosanna means save us, save us now. They were wanting Jesus to come riding in on a colt or horse, a steed, a, a horse of weaponry, of warfare, that his coming in on a horse would show that he was the commanding general to go and uh, the Jewish people would go and squash yeah. the Romans. And here Jesus comes in on the colt of a donkey and he's riding in as it was said in Zechariah, uh, Zephaniah chapter 9 verse 9, Rejoice, O daughter of Zion, shout greatly. For your king is coming in riding on the foal of a donkey. And so he's coming in riding, not as a beast of warfare, but one of peace. The donkey is a symbol of peace. And so from that, he's now come in, and he's come into this community. And they're waving their palm branches. And they're saying, Lord, save us. Protect us from the evil empire. Dum, dum, da, dum, dum, dum. Not Star Wars, not that one. We're talking about the whole fact of knowing that Jesus had a whole set of people that were trusting in him to help take care of their needs. And it's no different than what you and I have within our life. When we have a problem, we ask him to take care of our needs. But that wasn't what he was wanting to do. He has something far greater. He wanted to take care of their hearts for all of eternity. That sin would be squashed and vanquished forever. All we had to do is put our hope and trust in Jesus. And Jesus found this young donkey, and the Bible says he sat on it, and as he said, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Two reasons why Jesus came to the earth. <laughs> None of this is working like it's supposed to. I went through ten times yesterday. That's okay. It's just going to be that way. We're going to just we're going to make it happen here. Two reasons Jesus came to the earth. Number one, for spiritual reasons. The Bible says that when we worship him, we worship him in spirit. And in truth. And the truth is, until we put our trust in Him, we don't know what truth is all about. Amen? Amen. But yet, when we put it in, it comes in by an act of faith. Yeah. And it affects our spirit. Yeah. Nothing on the outside of our bodies changes us a lot. Sometimes the physical, it's all going to die one day. But the spirit's going to live on forever and forever. And the other reason Jesus came was a real simple one. is that He would be able to live like a human being. Jesus would identify with your needs and my needs of realizing the who we truly are. Amazing, isn't it? To know what He was going to do. He would become our Savior. He would become our friend in spirit and in truth. He would come and change the inside of who we are. But He would walk with us and talk with us and tell us we are His own. Amen. There's no enemy that's too big that your Jesus can't take care of. No matter what you're going through, whatever you're facing today, you're going to keep on deciding to do it on your own. He's going to let you do what you think you need to do. But if you need His help, then you need to change a little bit and change the rules of yourself 
in the fact that you need to put your trust in Him. When you put your trust in Him, He said He would never cast you out. He said He would always be with us. He would never leave us. He would never forsake us. But when we depend on ourselves, we'll have ourselves set up for failure. We keep short changing ourselves. We keep causing our own self not being able to stand. And we have to trust Him. And when we put our trust in Him, He's not only our Savior, and He will be our friend. But the Bible says, in just a few days later, a week later, something happens. A couple chapters over in chapter 18 of John, it talks about how Jesus has gone through about six trials leading up between these six chapters. And then the 18th chapter, He's gone to the garden. There's some other areas He's been a part of. But now he's standing in front of Pilate in John chapter 18. It says this, that Pilate asked Jesus a very particular question. So what he asked him is this. He says, so are you the king or not? I said, Jesus answered, you tell me because I am king. I was born and entered into this world so I could witness to the truth. Everyone who cares for truth or who has any feeling for the truth recognizes my voice. When you and I put our trust in Jesus... We'll start hearing His voice. His Spirit will speak to you, my friends. Yeah. Sometimes you go, well, how do I know it's His voice? We well, listen clearly enough. If you walk with Him and you've talked with Him, you'll start hearing His voice. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You hear the voice of the Holy Spirit who speaks to your spirit. And there are times where you feel like you're starting about to do something that's incorrect or something wrong, and it's like something inside of you pulls back on the brakes. And you go, maybe I don't need to do that. Now some of us, we just plow ahead and do it anyway. Because we're going to take care of whatever needs we have in our life, and we're not going to listen to some voice. Nobody's going to tell me what to do, we say. <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's an accident. Something happens. And then the Lord gets our attention. Pilate was simply asking him, so are you a king or not? So who do you say that you are? And then Jesus goes in and witnesses even to Pilate. In the rest of the story, Pilate's wife even speaks to her husband and says, Don't hurt this man. He hasn't done anything wrong. I've seen him in a dream. And you should let him go. And Pilate, under the peer pressure of the society of people, he didn't just make a decision. He simply called out to say, What do you think I should do? And they said, Let him go. Let him go. And others said, Crucify him. Well, we'll talk about that this coming week. Let's look at this next one. Because Jesus always remembered who he was. Jesus remembered, even growing up as a boy, that one time, even his stepfather, Joseph, had heard the angel tell him and said, You will give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. There's something inside of all of us we need to hear from time to time. We need to know that God is for us. And if God be for us, the Bible says, who can be against us? Amen. And if you have something inside of you always, when you're going up through some of the most difficult times of your life, when you feel like there's some moment that you don't know how to handle, when you're coming up against an enemy who's come against you, if there's some temptation that is so overwhelming that you feel like, I must give in to it. Or if you have a person at work or at school, someone who simply keeps nagging and digging at you of what to do. I believe you and I need, we need a promise. We need a thumb sketch. We need something that calls us back to who we are and why we're who we are. For me, I grew up hearing Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and call them according to His purposes. There's a lot of other verses I love to share with you, but for me, as a young Christian, that's what I stuck with, or what stuck with me as a young Christian. And so when the times came and it was more difficult for me and I didn't understand what to do, I'd always go back and say, all things are going to work together for good. It's all going to work out, because hope has come. Here comes hope. Jesus is the hope. Jesus will be there. And I had the confidence within my own heart that Jesus was going to work it all out. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen next week. I don't know what's going to happen in a few moments. But I'm confident today, aren't you, that Jesus is going to work it all out. Amen. And you need a verse like that. So maybe if it's not this one, because he's not going to use you to save your people from their sins, however, or their sins, however, there's a verse somewhere in the Bible you need to have. And I believe all Christians, when you've given your heart to Christ, when you've 
you've confessed your sins, you've repented of your sins, and you put your trust in Jesus Christ, there's some verse inside your heart that just keeps ringing out and you keep hearing it. More than John 3.16, but maybe that's the one that's working for you. Whatever it is, there's a, there's a verse, a life verse that's just for you. If you don't know what it is, talk to me. I'll be glad to help you and visit with you to try to seek that out. So when you do this, remember that He wants to help you to remember one thing. You need to remember who called you. In John 6.44 it says that you and I cannot come to Christ unless the Spirit of God calls us. He's calling you today. He calls some into vocational ministry called the pastorate or evangelism or missionary service, whatever it may be. He calls others of us to be those who ride on the back of sanitation trucks. and Some will work in state offices. Some work in the yards and they cultivate the yards. Uh, there are some who work for the military. Whatever it may be, He's called you to do some specific work. And the Bible also declares that when you do that work, do it as unto the Lord. If you don't like the employer and you feel like they're being unfair, just somehow inside of your spirit just say, I am going to work for this person. I'm going to have the right attitude as if I'm working for Jesus. Yeah. And start loving them. Start caring for them. Praying for them. Not praying against them. Not having a bad attitude. Never cursing them. Never setting them up for failure. Never trying to embarrass them. But doing everything to keep them from embarrassment. To make them look good. Because at the right time, the Lord, the Bible says, when you have a need that's so deep and so hard on your life and you don't know what else to do, you can always do a Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. You can enter into the closet. You can seek Him and you can pray openly. And it says the Father who sees you praying in secret will reward you openly. At the right time, He's going to be there for you and He's going to answer whatever needs you have and He'll make you look good and it'll be for the glory of God. Amen. Remember who called you. I have pastors who I work with at times, and when I talk with them about this, I've had some who say, what do I need to do? I said, there's a time that in your life, not only in your realm of delegation, what you need to do for their ministry, what they need to do, but you need to remember, instead of writing that resignation letter on Monday morning, instead of calling up those board members and chewing somebody out or having some bad attitude, not that pastors would ever have that, I've never had a wrong attitude in my life. I'm teasing, Lord. I'm just teasing, okay? I'm just teasing. But I sure don't have it now. And I don't have it among you. But there are pastor friends out there and evangelists out there. There are people out there doing the work of God who truly love Him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they love their neighbor as themselves. But the problem is, they get so much heat and they get so much negativity because the people who are given the negativity are not sanctified Christians. They're carnal Christians. And carnality is a disease that eats away at a person's spirit. Because it makes you look good and makes everybody else stink and have a bad day. It's like the man who was asleep one day and his two little rambunctious boys who came and spread this thin gel of Limburger cheese across his mustache. The man got up and you know the story how it goes. He got up and he said, man, this room stinks. He started getting ready for work. He never took a shower for whatever reason, so he got dressed and he went and got in his car. And he says, man, this car stinks. So he rolls the window down and he drives a little bit further to work. He says, oh, the air outside stinks. What in the world is that? He says, this whole place stinks. When in fact, sometimes the stink is right under the nose of your face. If you can look in the mirror and see it, it's right in front of you. We have to be careful, don't we, of the attitudes of who we are, of who we think we are. We're no greater than God, but God is trying to shape us to be like Him and have the same kind of spirit. Amen? And I tell these minister people, hey, remember who called you when it's getting tough. If grandma's called you, that's as far as it'll go. If mom or dad's called you, that's all you get. It'll sound good for a period of time, but when the Lord God Almighty has called you, it'll stick with you through the rest of eternity. So let God lead you. Oh, don't forget who has called you, friend. We cannot stop living in our human experience. But with the Holy Spirit of God, we are given His divine nature, His Spirit. When we know inside of us that He is in us, we are nothing but victorious all the way. So how do we apply this? First thing is, don't let your problems get you down. 
What are you going through today that's so difficult? Here, Jesus, he has no problems. He's riding into Jerusalem. Everything's been great. People have been anticipating him. He's now about 33 years of age. For three years of time, he's had this earthly ministry in a very special way. And he's had these disciples who's walked with him and been with him. Now they're riding in. He's coming into Jerusalem. People have impacted the streets, literally waving palm branches. We've heard of the one who's coming. He's the one called the Christ. He's Messiah. We've been waiting for him. He's here now. He's right here in front of us. Oh, they just wanted to touch the hem of his garment. They couldn't wait to get in front just to say, Hey, Jesus, see me? Hey, hey, I have a need to you. Hey, Jesus. Everybody wanted to squeeze in to see this special dignitary, so to speak. And yet Jesus didn't see himself as some highfalutin person. He just saw himself as an everyday common person. But he knew in his heart and spirit that he was sent there by Almighty God. In fact, he is God. And in his human existence, he was trying to identify and was identifying with so many of these humans. The second thing you need to remember is not only remember, don't let the problems get you down. You've got to surrender those to him. But you need to teach yourself how to consecrate that carnal nature. The carnal nature that you have within your life is the area that says, look at me, look how important I am. I'm going to take care of me first. I'm going to take care of my needs. I don't care about your needs, I'm going to take care of me. And they'll say they care about you. It's kind of like when Judas said, why did you use this on him? We could have, we could have used that money. It could have fed so many people. He was shown a realm of carnality. He acted like, to make it sound salvific, he wanted to make it sound like he really cared about the people. But when you're carnal, you can't hide that. <coughs> There's a time I had this attitude in our young marriage. And uh, I don't know where I was at spiritually at that time. I can't recall at this moment. But remember, Nita's parents had a distinctive tone about who they were. Her dad had a, this thing. He, well, I'll just leave it with that. He was, he was awesome. I love their parents. I love my parents. But my parents had a distinctive attitude as well, and so did my father. So there were times where I, in my young married times, I said, okay, George. <laughs> so her response to me says, well, at least I know who I am, Ray. <laughs> I got to a place where I knew I had to fix it. Because I was a young Christian, and I'm supposed to have this attitude. And I was coming across wrong. I didn't really understand what carnality was, but I was starting to get the picture. Because I didn't want to be identified as my dad. I didn't, I didn't like the nature and attitude that he carried. There were times he was gruff, and there were times he was harsh. And he would seem loving, and, and he did a lot of great things, and I, I appreciated that so much. But for someone to call me by my father's name meant like I had gone down in life. That's what I was thinking. I don't know if you ever felt that way, but that's what I was feeling. And so I guess I thought in my defensiveness of calling Nita her father's first name, I was trying to set something up to make me look good and make her look bad. And so when she responded back to kind of, excuse me, counter it, it came alive to me that I needed to do something that was proper. And so I said, well, I am sorry. I said it about like that. I remember that. And her response in a loving way was, yes, you are. <laughs> true story. <laughs> the only way to get rid of that is to consecrate the carnality. Okay. When you and I come and as if we have an altar of sacrifice, we concentrate, consecrate our very spirits because we don't know what to do about it. For some of you understand when I talk about palms down, you're basically consecrating whatever your fear is. You're putting a palm down. You may feel like you're in control this way, but when you release it and let go of it, you're basically saying in your spirit, Oh God, I can't, I can't carry this. I don't know what to do about it. I consecrate it to you. I could consecrate myself to you. I ask, Oh Lord, that you just take me as all of me, who I am. And I don't know how to work it out. I don't know how to fix these things. But I know if you'll just take care of it, 
It'll be okay. And I'm going to let go. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to do my best to just let it go. And that's what consecration is for. And you say something like, Oh God, I consecrate. I give myself to you. Would you just set me free? Would you give your spirit to me? Would you let your spirit so have charge of everything in my life? You see, beloved, when you become a Christian, God doesn't just come and go anytime. He's always in you. Yeah. You have the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit inside of you. But when you are regenerated, when you're saved, when you're born again, you're initially sanctified. And what that means is that you have all of God. The problem is He doesn't have all of you. Mm. And until He gets all of you, he still won't let you call the shots. But until you consecrate your will to Him and let Him have all of you, then you'll let Him call the shots, even though you don't agree with it. You fulfill it and follow through, and you're not afraid whether the storms come. You're not worried because God is in control. And when you let Him be in control, your life completely changes. Something incredible happens. You start loving people in a higher fashion of a way. Not that they dress nicer. They could be the dirtiest people on the street and you'll go and embrace them and hug them because to you, you start seeing people through the eyes of Christ. And as He would see them, you embrace them, you reach out to them the same way Jesus would. Because daily, His Spirit is telling you, love them. And the world is saying, no, don't take a risk. You'll stink if you get too close to these people. But you just love them in Jesus' name. It doesn't mean they're going to agree or want you to be around them. But the very act of the intentions and emotives of your spirit becomes Christ-like. And what happens, whenever that time is, God the Father sanctifies you and sets you apart. The word sanctify means to set you apart for His service. Yeah. When we ask for Him to anoint these uh, elements for today, I ask for a, that He would sanctify them to set them apart for the purpose that we have for today. They're just bread. It's just juice. It means nothing. You can go home and eat a whole loaf of bread of 16 slices and drink a pint of juice and you'll have nothing but carb uh, overflow, and you'll be bouncing off the walls from all the sugar that's inside your system. <laughs> Would you let Him sanctify you? The church will not only be just who's here, this church will take off in a new way that it's never done before. We'll have to do three and four services with the amount of people we have here who are reaching out and winning people because we have asked Him that we've consecrated ourselves. It's not just that we ask Him to make us holy and not be infected by everybody else, but He wants to spiritually inoculate you and me so we can go out and do the work that Jesus did. Amen. The mission field is not this building. Amen. The mission field is beyond the property of 1983 Mayhem Drive. Amen. Amen. It's not here. Here's a place we come to celebrate, a place to worship. This is not about funerals today. Amen. Let me press on. The Bible is, says, do you remember Mary and Martha? Martha is the one holding the jug, and she's standing up. She's saying, Lord, tell Mary to come help me. We have food. We have people here. We need to take care of their needs. Why can't she help me? Why will she not come and help me? She has a responsibility. She's my sister. Why don't you listen to you, to me? Well, I'm your sister. Why don't you listen to me? And she's just poured this expensive perfume of nard, spike nard, on his feet. And Jesus said, what she's doing, she's preparing me for my burial. All the way 33 years earlier, when the wise men came and they brought these elements to celebrate Jesus, even part of it for his, his, uh, his burial. Now she's pouring the same kind of element almost onto his feet to just prepare his body for this anointing. And Jesus said, leave her alone. She's doing what she needs to be doing. Are we the ones that's in the kitchen? Are we the ones who are taking care of everybody because we're a fellowshipping type of church? Are we the type of people that are so deep in fellowship that we don't hear the spiritual needs that are before us. You see, a life that's consecrated to the Lord God will listen for those nonverbal cues of what people are truly saying. People with their mouth will say, Oh, I'm having a good day. It's a blast. But when you look at their face and know what's going on a little bit in their life and not judging them, you can walk up to them and say, 
hey, can I just pray with you? Or is there something I can pray with you about? And a lot of times those folks will say, yes, I need to pray. And a moment ago they were just full of joy, now they're crying. You're not trying to make them cry. Just trying to let them know that you care and you love them. It doesn't matter how bad it is. What Jesus is telling Martha is this. He says, Martha, I don't want your cooking. I want your company. Jesus doesn't just want our cooking. He wants our company. Does He have your company today? If Jesus were here in the room, could you be patient to kneel down at the foot of Jesus? Could you even take your hair if you had it long enough or that you could wipe and rub oil or something on His feet? Or if nothing else, if you just had yourself and just laid yourself down and just came next to Jesus, just to draw up next to Him, to just scoot up against Him like a child would to someone that they love, they just come pull themselves up to you so closely. Could that be you? I have some pictures I want to show you here. This is where Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem. The people have crowded the streets so heavily, they're so packed that you can't even hardly see uh, this other person here. But the people who are turning, this little kid's about to be lost in all the crowd. He's about to be stampeded from other people. And yet, they're all saying, Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But I'm going to wrap it up with these two other pictures that I made. <laughs> what about the time of Palm Sunday in your life? Because I believe Palm Sundays come pretty much every day. We all have days of celebration within our lives. What about the time when this young woman, who's whether married or not married? And this is not a judgment. This is not a political statement, although it will sound like one. But then she gets to a place, she has people on the right and the left side who start telling her how to... Uh, live her life. They're advising her. Some are saying, well, are you going to get married? Are you not married? And they start making all these value judgments. And the girl starts hearing the differences between right to life and Planned Parenthood. Somewhere within 12 to 18 days, there's a heartbeat in an unborn child. And in 40 days, the brain is already attacked. And yet, there are some states who are wanting to wait until the point of birth to do an abortion. And thank God there's a lot of states that are starting to take a stand to stop this nonsense. It's kind of like someone taking a giant vacuum cleaner. It would be a really big vacuum cleaner on me. But to just start sucking me out through limb by limb until I'm torn apart and the blood is just ripping out of my body. And I apologize to say something so graphic. But yet the reality is these young children, 4,000 plus a day, are being ripped to shreds and torn or chemically burned and choked out and dying in the wombs of women. And this woman has a big concern here because this is a picture of a little child who's in the womb of a mother still sucking his thumb, needing that nurture. Why in the world would I bring this up? I don't know. But the Holy Spirit said you need to show this because people need to identify and understand it's not that Jesus just had to ride into Jerusalem and then a, a few days later from the Passover until the day that he would, uh, six days later, he would be crucified for the sins of humanity. But realizing that God loves even at the very essence and starting of birth. He loves children that are in the womb. So much that Jesus died for them. The reality is those children that have been aborted, they're taken care of. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven one day we've never met as all the calls of God has already taken care of them. Beloved, the whole, the whole thing of knowing of what He's doing for us is that sometimes you are faced with a decision like an abortion. It might be that insurmountable, so huge, you don't know what to do about it. Something so big that you're willing to give up your Christian walk to give in so that you won't be punished or pain. I'm here to tell you today, don't surrender to that. Don't give in to any temptation that's so harsh. Don't give in to any sin that will destroy you for the rest of your life. God loves you with an everlasting love, an undying love. If Jesus could come back and die for us again, if that would make a difference, He would do that. But He doesn't need to, amen? He doesn't need to.
And today as you go, be reminded of this. There are countless thousands of people that you and I will run those with a bump around through stores and gas station lines, through school, through work, different places in our own families who are going through these big decisions. These huge decisions that sometimes they don't know the truth. Since I've shown you the pictures, I'll tell you this in one area. There's a movie out called Unplugged. You're not able to deal with the first 10 minutes of it eventually because it will show you something that you don't want to see. And we as Christians will become like the ostriches. The spiritual ostriches will want to put our heads in the ground and act like nothing's ever going on when the reality of life is right in front of us. And I ask you today, maybe there's something that's so big in your life that you need to surrender to the Lord. Maybe it's going to go see the movie Unplugged. It'll probably be out much longer. Unplanned. I mean, Unplanned. I'm sorry. Unplanned. 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 It's called Unplanned. Thank you. Go see it if you can. It'll change your life, I believe. It'll help you have more compassion towards other people. Isn't it time we start trusting Jesus and not ourselves? Would you stand with me for a moment? They're playing a song, Come Just As You Are. I don't know what's on your heart. It doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, how long you've been a Christian, or if you're a new Christian. If you're here today and never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, or if you're living in an act of sin right now and you need to repent of that, I implore you to come and pray. Come kneel at these altars or these watch these uh, palm branches. Come and kneel or come sit on the front row. I'd love to pray with you. I really would. Because until you have Jesus Christ reigning in your life, friend, one day you'll be lost forever. That's the truth. And Jesus said He doesn't want anyone to perish but all to come to everlasting life. That's you. Do you have the life that He's died for for you? Or are you just living half the way what you think you need? While they're playing, I invite you to come. If you're a Christian who's been here for some time and you feel like you need to have this sanctified heart and you're willing to consecrate all that you have, lay it on the altar, not hide back anything, surrender it to the Lord God. He'll receive it and take it even this day. Is that you, beloved? He wants to receive it. He wants to receive you today. Come just as
Father, we thank you for the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for all that our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. We thank you for everyone in your divine presence. And may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be found acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, dismiss us now with your presence. May your glory go wherever we step. And again, may this be a day that Jesus is lifted up for your glory. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you today. <clears throat>